it is not their sins per se that characterize evil people. Rather, it is the subtlety and persistence and consistency of their sins. This is because the central defect of the evil is not the sin, but the refusal to acknowledge it. Bobby's parents, except for their evil, are most ordinary. They live down the street, on any street. They may be rich or poor educated or uneducated. There is little that is dramatic about them. They are not designated criminals. More often than not, they will be solid citizens, Sunday school teachers, policemen or bankers and active in the PTA. How can this be? How can they be evil and not designated as criminals? The key lies in the word designated. They are criminals in that they commit crimes against life and liveliness. Their crimes are so subtle and covert that they cannot be clearly designated as crimes. I spent a good deal of time working in prison with designated criminals. Almost never have I experienced them as evil people. People in jail can almost always be assigned a standard psychiatric diagnosis of one kind or another. The men and women I talk about, such as Bobby's parents, have no such obvious defects and do not fall clearly into our routine psychiatric pigeonholes. This is not because the evil are healthy. It is simply because we have not yet developed a definition for their disease. Since I distinguish between evil people and ordinary criminals, I also obviously make the distinction between evil as a personality characteristic and evil deeds. In other words, evil deeds do not an evil person make. Otherwise, we should all be evil because we all do evil things. Sinning is most broadly defined as missing the mark. This means that sin is nothing more and nothing less than a failure to be continually perfect. Because it is impossible for us to be continually perfect, we are all sinners. We routinely fail to do the very best of which we are capable. And with each failure, we commit a crime of sorts against God, our neighbors or ourselves, if not, frankly, against the law. Of course, there are crimes of greater and lesser magnitude. It is a mistake, however, to think of sin or evil as a matter of degree. It may seem less odious to cheat the rich than the poor, but it is still cheating. If evil people cannot be defined by the illegality of their deed or the magnitude of their sins, then how are we to define them? The answer is by the consistency of their sins. While usually subtle, their destructiveness is remarkably consistent. This is because those who have crossed over the line are characterized by the absolute refusal to tolerate the sense of their own sinfulness. I commented that George, blessed by guilt, managed to turn away from becoming evil because he was willing, at least to a rudimentary degree, to tolerate the sense of his own sinfulness. He was able to reject his pact with the devil. Had he not borne the pain of the guilt, he's, he experienced over the past, his moral deterioration would have continued. More than anything else, it is the sense of our own sinfulness that prevents any of us from undergoing a similar deterioration. A predominant characteristic of the behavior of those I call evil is scapegoating. Because in their hearts, they consider themselves above reproach. They must lash out at anyone who does reproach them. They sacrifice others to preserve their self-image of perfection. Evil, then, is most often committed in order to scapegoat, and the people are labeled as evil are chronic scapegoaters. They attacked others instead of facing their own failures. As life often threatens their self-image of perfection, evil people are often busily engaged in hating and destroying that life, usually in the name of righteousness. The fault, however, may not be so much that they hate life as that they do not hate the sinful part of themselves. I doubt that Bobby's parents deliberately wanted to kill Stuart or him. I suspect that their murderous behavior was totally dictated by an extreme form of self-protectiveness, which invariably sacrificed others rather than themselves. What is the cause of this failure of self-hatred? This failure to be displeasing to oneself, which seems to be the central sin at the root of the scapegoating behavior of those I call evil. The cause is not, I believe, an absent conscience. 
There are people both in and out of jail who seem utterly lacking in conscience or superego. Psychiatrists call them psychopaths or sociopaths. Guiltless, they not only committed crimes, but may often do so with a kind of reckless abandon that is not particularly characterized by scapegoating. This is hardly the case with those I call evil. Utterly dedicated to preserving their self-image of perfection, they are unceasingly engaged in the effort to maintain the appearance of moral purity. They worry about this a great deal. They are acutely sensitive to social norms and what others might think of them. Like Bobby's parents, they dress well, go to work on time, pay their taxes, and outwardly seem to live lives that are above reproach. The words, image, and appearance, and outwardly, are crucial to the understanding of the morality of the evil. While they seem to lack any motivation to be good, they intensely desire to appear good. Their goodness is all on the level of pretense. It is, in effect, a lie. This is why they are called the people of the lie. Actually, the lie is designed not so much to deceive others as to deceive themselves. They cannot or will not tolerate the pain of self-reproach. The decorum with which they lead their lives is maintained as a mirror in which they can see themselves reflected righteously. Yet the self-deceit would be unnecessary if the evil have no sense of right and wrong. We lie only when we are attempting to cover up something we know to be illicit. Some rudimentary form of conscience must precede the act of lying. There is no need to hide unless we first feel that something needs to be hidden. We come now to a sort of paradox. I have said that evil people feel themselves to be perfect. At the same time, however, I think they have an unacknowledged sense of their own evil nature. Indeed, it is this very sense from which they are frantically trying to flee. The essential component of evil is not the absence of a sense of sin or imperfection, but the unwillingness to tolerate that sense. At one and the same time, the evil are aware of their evil and desperately trying to avoid the awareness. Rather than blissfully lacking a sense of morality, like the psychopath, they are continually engaged in sweeping the evidence of their evil under the rug of their own consciousness. For everything they did, Bobby's parents had a rationalization, a whitewash good enough for themselves, even if not for me. The problem is not a defect of conscience, but the effort to deny the conscience its due. We become evil by attempting to hide from ourselves. The wickedness of the evil is not committed directly, but indirectly as part of this cover-up process. Evil originates not in the absence of guilt, but in the effort to escape in the road less traveled. I suggested that laziness or the desire to escape legitimate suffering lies at the root of all. Mental illness. What distinguishes the evil, however, from the rest of us mentally ill sinners is the specific type of pain. They cannot tolerate the pain of their own conscience, the pain of the realization of their own sinfulness and imperfection. If the central defect of the evil is not one of conscience, then where does it reside? The essential psychological problem of human evil, I believe, is a particular variety of narcissism that Eric Fromm called malignant narcissism. Narcissism, or self-absorption, takes many forms. Malignant narcissism is characterized by an unsubmitted will. All adults who are mentally healthy submit themselves, one way or another, to something higher than themselves. Be it God or truth or love or some other ideal, to a greater or lesser degree, all mentally healthy individuals submit themselves to the demands of their own conscience. Not so the evil. However, in the conflict between their guilt and their will, it is the guilt that must go and the will that must win. They are men and women of extraordinary willfulness. There is a remarkable power in the manner in which they attempt to control others. Indeed, it is almost tempting to think that the problem of evil lies in the will itself. Perhaps the evil are born so inherently strong-willed that it is impossible for them ever to submit their will. Yet, I think it is characteristic of all great people that they are extremely strong-willed, whether their greatness be for good or for evil. The strong will, the power and authority, 
of Jesus radiates from the Gospels, just as Hitler's did from his book. But Jesus' will was that of his father, and Hitler's that of his own. The crucial distinction is between willingness and willfulness. There are many ways to look at the genesis of human evil. The fact of the matter is that some of us are very good and some of us are evil, and most of us are somewhere in between we might, therefore, think of human good and evil as a kind of continuum. As individuals, we can move ourselves one way or another along the continuum. Just as there is a tendency for the rich to get richer, however, and the poor to get poorer, so there seems to be a tendency for the good to get better and the bad to get worse. Eric Fromm saw the genesis of human evil as a developmental process. We are not created evil or forced to be evil, but we become evil slowly every time through a long series of choices. I applaud his view, particularly its emphasis upon choice and will. I think it is correct, as far as it goes, but I do not think it is the whole truth of the matter. On the one hand, it does not take into account the tremendous forces that tend to shape the being of the young child before it has much opportunity to exercise its will in true freedom of choice. On the other hand, it perhaps underestimates the very power of the will itself. In my view, the issue of free will, like so many great truths, is a paradox. On the one hand, free will is a reality. We can be free to choose with conditioning or other factors. On the other hand, we cannot choose freedom. There are only two states of being, submission to God and goodness, or the refusal to submit to anything beyond one's own will, which refusal automatically enslaves one to the forces of evil. We must ultimately belong either to God or the devil. We must choose.